Good evening, everyone. If you have a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We're going to consider some things here in just a minute. It was about two months ago, I think, at work. I was standing in my cubicle, and a coworker, I'd not met this coworker before, and I've actually never seen her since. Um, she was just wandering through the aisleways, and, you know, our big cubicle farm, she comes by my cube, and she's, as she's walking by, she looks in, and then she looks, and she double takes, and stops. And she stops for a very awkward period of time. You know that, you know how they say, when you go to the movie theater, you see that slide that pops up on the screen that says, silence is golden? At that moment, it became very clear that that slide is completely wrong. Because silence is awkward, and this woman sat, stood there silently staring at me, and this is what she said after a few seconds. She says, you're not who I was expecting to see. Okay? And then we proceeded to talk about my mustache, uh, which happens, and it's been happening for the entire time I've had this silly thing. And it's gotten me sort of thinking about, along with some other conversations and things that, I, that I've been talking to some of you guys about, about awkward interactions. You know, we have all kinds of awkward interactions, right? Lance was just telling me about how he went to the ballet the other night and how awkward that was. You know, totally, we all understand that awkward situations, awkward places, places where, you know, we're just not super comfortable, where we're not, we don't feel like we fit in, you know, that, that can be uncomfortable for us. And it really got started to get me thinking about it after Vernon prayed a prayer a, a little while back where he asked that we have the courage to stand up and say things that are not politically correct. That we're not living a life that is all about political correctness. And that's why we're here in John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse 18, Jesus tells us a very profound truth that I'm going to use as the basis for our lesson tonight. Jesus says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. All right, so the world is going to hate you. Just accept that. The world is going to hate you. Now, we kind of talked about it in our, in our uh, Bible class this afternoon. You know, the world is becoming more permissive. The, the world is becoming sort of more accepting of, of morality and, and, and people living the way that they do, irrespective of how the world acts, irrespective of what the world feels like, you will be hated by the world. And how do I know that? Because Jesus goes on to say in verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Does the world love you? Really, stop to think about that. Does the world love you? Because if the world loves you, I think Jesus is telling you here, there's something wrong with the way you're living. If the world loves you, that might mean you are of the world. Let's be careful. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the, world, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. I've heard this verse explained away a lot of times. And of course, with the, you know, not to make trivial the, the suffering and persecution that other people go through. We're going to talk tonight about some of the trials that you and I face, and if we even still face trials in our life today. And I will say that if you are living a life, walking down that narrow path, the world will not love you. The world will hate you. And that's what Jesus says here. He says, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. The world doesn't know God. The world walks the broad road. The world walks in the way that it walks. The world walks with political correctness and all the other societal norms that the world puts in place. And as the world gets more and more interested in accepting every definition of marriage, and as the world gets more and more accepting of, of every definition of what the family is or how we should be serving a God or any God or, or whoever, you are going to stand out even more. We, as followers of Jesus Christ, walk down the narrow path. We don't fit into the societal norms that exist today. We don't fit into the political correctness that exists today. And if you find yourself, as part of this lesson, in asking yourself about your own life, if you find yourself fitting in a little bit too much with the societal norms of this world, it's 
probably time to make a change. The temptation, though, I think for all of us is to hide our light. Jesus talked about, you know, and every, all the little kids know the song, right? Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. Jesus talked about a city that was set on a hill can't be hidden. Everybody is going to see that. And what we need to do in our life is not hide our light under a bushel. But in doing that, in letting our light shine, it is going to have some consequences in your comfort level day to day. You are not going to be comfortable in this life by letting your light shine. You are going to endure awkward situations, awkward conversations, conversations that challenge you, conversations that, that put you and your faith to the test. And we're going to talk about some of those in this lesson. We need to become courageous. We need to become bold. We need to have the perspective that, you know, this life and the temporary nature of this life, how long is this all going to last? Mitch says it all the time, every time, almost every time he gets up here. I love, I love the perspective that he gives on this. This is all just passing away, isn't it? All, everything in this life, it's all just passing away. We're just here for a little while, and while we're here, let's focus on doing what we need to be doing and having the courage that we need to have. A little bit of, a little bit of discomfort now, a lot of comfort later. That, that's what I want. Today, I want to ask us ourselves two questions. And I don't have slides, so you're going to have to look at my awkward face, which is great. Two questions. The first question is this. Am I, you personally, am I living an awkward life? Am I living an awkward life? Second question. Do I embrace awkward interactions with others? Am I living an awkward life? And do I embrace awkward interactions with others? And, and to, to help illustrate this, we're going to look at the perfect example, which is Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at Jesus' example and ask if he was willing to live an awkward life, if he was willing to embrace awkward interactions with others. And then I want to look at an example of one of his disciples who was a great talker, but not a great doer when it came to, to living awkwardly in this life. And then I want to ask ourselves some practical applications for our own life. Are we willing to live an awkward life? And are we willing to embrace awkward interactions with others? So if you're in John chapter 15, turn back to John chapter 6. And we're going to start with this first question, am I living an awkward life? By looking at Jesus himself. Jesus here... I think the perception is that Jesus is the Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, Sermon on the Mount Jesus, who teaches some very powerful things, but not necessarily some overly challenging things. I would say that, that in the Sermon on the Mount, there are some very, very challenging things. But I think the perception in the world is that Jesus is, he'd never really teach anything that was overly complicated or overly challenging. John chapter 6, though, Jesus really starts to make the point very clearly about whether he's here to tickle people's ears or not. Let's begin reading in verse 51. Actually, if you back up uh, to verse 41 for some context, the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Jesus is attempting there uh, to talk about how he is a comparison or, or a type of the manna that came down from heaven in the Old Testament for the people, for the children of Israel to eat. And he's comparing himself to that manna. And the Jews don't really like this comparison very much. In fact, they're saying, you know, I, I don't really appreciate, Jesus, that you're comparing yourself to this staple of our, of our Jewish heritage. Verse 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Now, we, we're all sort of in this sterile environment where we've studied this passage a lot. Everybody here, hopefully, who's able to comprehend these things, these spiritual things, understands what Jesus is saying. When he says, the bread that I shall give is my flesh, we understand what he's really talking about. But what did the audience that he's speaking to now at this very moment, what did they think he was talking about? Let's move on. Verse 52, the Jews then quarreled amongst themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Yeah, that's what they were thinking. Oh, they thought that. They, they were confused. Jesus, you mean we're supposed to eat your skin? Huh? 
And that's, that's the fleshly mindset that they had. Jesus knows exactly what they're thinking, what they're misinterpreting. And Jesus doesn't go, okay, guys, that's not what I really meant. You all know I was just kidding. Well, what did Jesus do? Verse 53, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat my, the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Jesus is pushing. He is pushing the envelope. He is pressing on them to see where they're going to break. You're going to follow me? You really want to follow me? Then you have to understand some complicated truths, some difficult truths. Whoever eats my flesh, he just keeps going on and on. He doesn't just let up. He doesn't stop there or, or explain himself. He keeps saying it over and over again. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. For my flesh is food indeed. There he goes again. Another verse. He's, he's just keeping on expanding. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, there he says it again. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living father sent me, I live because of the father. So he who feeds on me will live because of, how many times does Jesus need to say that over and over again, that somebody who eats his flesh and drinks his blood is going to have life? And he understand, he knows that this is challenging for them, yet he keeps saying it over and over and over again. Verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. All right, now verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they, had, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Uh, it? You think that's a hard saying? You think it's really challenging to understand what Jesus is talking about? I think it was. Because on the surface, this looks really strange. And they said, this is a hard thing. Who understands what, what you're saying? Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? And then drop down to verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Jesus wasn't trying to fit in with the popular teachings of the day. He wasn't out there trying to tickle people's ears. He wasn't trying to present a flowery message so that everybody would just hold hands and sing kumbaya. He was attempting to get them to make a decision. Are you going to follow me? Are you going to think spiritually or are you going to think physically? I'm going to throw a message at you that is so physically challenging for you to accept that if you don't start thinking spiritually, you're never going to understand it. And from that day, verse 66, many of his disciples chose the other choice. They chose... To, to walk their own path. They chose to leave Jesus' side. He presented the truth. And what I find so important about Jesus' handling of this awkward situation was that he wasn't so concerned about what it sounded like. Was Jesus concerned about what this message sounded like? He wasn't. He wanted to teach them truth. He wanted them to make a decision. He wanted them to have to make a choice. And did they make a choice? They did make a choice. And from that day, many people chose not to follow after Jesus anymore. He was focused on his goal of saving others. Because who else? Who, who else besides Jesus is going to provide eternal life? Nobody. And Jesus is trying to get them to see that he is the only way. He is the only bread. He is the only drink that anyone can, can feast on to have eternal life. So was Jesus willing to live an awkward life? Was he willing to teach some very awkward truths? He absolutely was. But then we see an example moving on in verse 40, or 67. Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? I think that's sort of a natural conclusion, right? He looks at all these disciples and all these disciples who are leaving his side, and then what does he say? You guys want to go too? You ready to go as well? And who pipes up? It's Peter right? Impetuous Peter. Peter stands up and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And that's, that's what Jesus was trying to say. That's what Jesus was trying to get them to make the choice and, and, and come to the conclusion of, Jesus, you're the only way. You're the only one here who has eternal life. Also, we've come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So here's, here's the next example. Was Jesus willing to live an awkward life? Yes. How about Peter? 
Was Peter willing to live an awkward life? Now, I'll say this. Peter was not, he, Peter was not a, a person who would shy away from a fight. But Peter was also not somebody who was very consistent with doing things all the way through. And we're going to look at that here in just a second. I can relate to Peter. I don't know if I can relate to Paul so much, but I can relate to Peter. Because who's Peter? He's somebody who is out there, and he's, he's zealous. He's sort of loud-mouthed, I guess. I can, I, it, Peter and I are ha holding hands there. But you know what Peter is? Peter is scared to death. Peter is scared to death. And I know that because of John uh, chapter 18. Let's turn over to John 18. This is the account of when Jesus goes to, the, goes to the, uh, his trials. John chapter 18. Is Peter willing to live an awkward life? Let's begin reading in verse 17. Then the servant girl who, who kept the door said to Peter, You're also not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now hold on. I know we talk a lot about the persecutions that go on in other places and the trials that occur in other places. Here's Peter standing before who? An armed guard with a sword ready to chop off his head. Who's he standing in front of? A tiny little girl standing at a door. What does he have to lose by being honest? What does he have to lose by standing up and saying the truth about whose disciple he really was? Now, sure, you, maybe you can make the argument that he might have lost his life along with Jesus. You might be able to say that, and that might, might very well be true, but he's standing in front of a little girl, and the little girl asks, are, are you one of his disciples? And what does he say? He says, I am not. Go down to verse 25. Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. There he is, along with everybody else. Therefore they said to him, you're not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it, and he says, I am not. There's the second time. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off. Now I want to stop here for just a second because it mentions here this event. Was Peter courageous? You better believe he was. Because Peter grabs a sword and lops off some guy's ear for Jesus. So I don't know when the last time you grabbed a sword and lopped off somebody's ear for the cause of Christ, but I think that shows a lot of courage. But of all the times where you need to be courageous, why is it then and not now? Why is it when you can whip out a sword, but you can't actually just say, yes? Why is it that we can do some great, wonderful, magical, you know, showy thing, but we can't do the small thing of saying, yes, I'm with Jesus. I know him. I'm with him. I am his disciple. And Peter is unable to do that. And in verse uh, verse 26 going on. He says, are, are you not this man? Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter then denied him a third time, and the rooster crows. So was Peter willing to live an awkward life? Peter was so afraid of not fitting in. He was so afraid of being found out that it, it paralyzed him to do the thing that he knew he needed to do. He, in fact, I would go on to say he loved the praise of men rather than the praise of God. He wanted these people who were there, this little girl and these people around the fire to accept him. He wasn't as concerned with God accepting him. He wasn't as concerned with standing up with Jesus Christ. And the fact that I find just so amazing was he knew better. Didn't he know better? Look over at Mark chapter 14. Turn back over to Mark 14. So I, think, I think sometimes... You know, maybe we feel like Peter's just caught off guard here in this case, but he's not. He's not at all. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Verse 27 of Mark chapter 14, Jesus says, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's one of my favorite verses, by the way. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And what happens when Jesus goes to that cross? Those little sheep just run away. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew what was going to happen. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Verse 29, Peter stands up again, impetuous Peter. Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not. And then what does Jesus tell him? Not only are you going to stumble, Peter, but you're going to stumble three times. 
And what does Peter say? But he spoke more vehemently in verse 31. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said likewise. So, does Peter talk a good game? Oh, he sure does. Do I talk a good game? Oh, I sure do. I could talk all Sunday long about how how courageous I'm going to be throughout the week and how I'm going to take advantage of my opportunities and how I'm going to look for those fields that are white with harvest. But am am I courageous on Monday and on Tuesday? When it really comes down to standing up and saying, yes, I'm his disciple, am I willing to do that? He knew better, even if he had to die. And was he being asked to die here? It's not clear that he was. In fact, all he had to do was stand before a little girl and say, yeah, I know him. What does he have to fear? He wastes an opportunity to confess Jesus Christ and to be an example to the world. Can you think about what might have happened if Peter would have been courageous and stood up and and confessed that he was a disciple of Jesus Christ? What opportunities he could have had at that moment to influence people to know Jesus. Yet he wastes it all. So was Peter willing to live an awkward life? Sometimes he was. When it really counted though, not so much. And so what about us? What about you? Are you willing to live an awkward life? And I'll say that I think we need to make sure, just like Peter was, was so afraid of fitting in, I think we need to not hide our faith. We need to not hide our faith. We need to be the ones who stand up like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did and be able to say, even if all of you guys around me are bowing down to this false god, you know where I am? I'm bowing down to my Lord. Not these false gods. Not this world. We need to be the ones to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We need to not hide our faith from others, but be willing to stand up and live an honest and genuine life. And I think sometimes it's easy for us to put on a show because we talk about perfection. We talk about being perfect as Jesus is perfect. But you know how easy it is to put on a show? We dog on the Pharisees a lot because the Pharisees really did have a problem with this. They were whitewashed tombs on the outside. They looked so good. But what what was going on on the inside? Maybe that's something that affects us. You ever, when was the last time you took the example of James and confessed your trespasses to someone else. You know that's awkward. Let's be honest with you. It's awkward to sit across a table from somebody alone and tell them exactly what sins you're struggling with. Now I think sometimes we 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 apply James chapter two and, and James I said James chapter two and I know I am wrong. That is not James chapter two. I think sometimes we apply, misapply James chapter 5, ha, verse 16. And we, we, we think about that in terms of coming forward, coming to the front, sitting on the pew, and, and confessing our trespasses to one another. I don't think that's what James is really talking about. It is good for us to, to confess our sins when they're of a public nature. But you know what? Sometimes we need to go to a brother and say, I'm having a hard time with something, and I need your prayers, and do that privately. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you were open? When was the last time you embraced an awkward life? When was the last time you stopped pretending like you were, had everything figured out and were honest enough with someone else to say, I'm wrong and I'm sorry? We're not perfect. We need to be humble, though. And when the world looks at us and sees that we do actually mean it when we say we're humble, When the world looks at us and says, they're just on the road just like I am. They don't have it all figured out just like I don't have it all figured out. Then we become approachable. We become a tool that can be used for the Lord's work. We need to focus on the goal of getting to heaven and leading others there. We need to focus on that that goal of, of really using every opportunity. And that's sort of what this whole personal evangelism class is all about using our opportunities, looking around, being opportunistic about the times and the the circumstances that we can open up and talk about Jesus. When somebody at at work tells us that they are going to church, what do we do? Do we keep our mouths shut? Or do we use that opportunity to say, oh, tell me more? Do we use the opportunities we have to listen or to communicate with our friends and brothers and coworkers? 
We need to focus on the goal of being a good example and leading others to Christ and not getting so caught up in the business of this world. You know how busy this world is? You got kids and soccer and gym and all the other things that people do. You know how busy this world is. You know how busy things can get. Guess what, though? This life is temporary. It's not going to last forever. So what will you have spent your time doing? So are you willing to live an awkward life? And then the last question that I have is, do I embrace awkward interactions with others? Turn with me to the book of Luke in chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Do I embrace awkward interactions with others? Well, we're going to look at Jesus. Did Jesus embrace awkward interactions with others? Verse 27 of Luke chapter 5. It says, After these things he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. I love that. You talk about personal evangelism and, and, and tactics to, to get people to, to hear the gospel. What does Jesus do? He just walks by this guy and says, Hey, come here. Follow me. And what does Levi do? So he left. All rose up and followed him. Well, I guess it worked. <laughs> All Jesus had to do was confront him and say, follow me. And Levi does. Good on Levi. So then Levi gives him a great feast in his own house in verse 29. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat with them. And we're not going to go in and talk too much about tax collectors and with the kind of people that they were. Were tax collectors very moral, upstanding people? No, they were not. The Jews did not like them. The, the Jews were not the tax collector's biggest fans. The tax collectors were probably some pretty shady, seedy people. And there, Jesus is with these tax collectors, and the scribes and Pharisees, in verse 30, complained against his disciples, saying, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, let me ask you guys a question, and think about this. Put yourself back at this moment. Do you think when Jesus sat down at that table with those tax collectors and sinners that miraculously all of those people became suddenly moral? Or do you think Jesus was sitting there with a bunch of people talking about sultry things, salty language, with all kinds of discussions about impropriety and cheating and all the things that the tax collectors might have done, do you think Jesus was there in a, in a, in a perfectly sterile environment with them? But that's what the Pharisees are complaining about here. But you say, Jesus, what are you doing here with these guys? And Jesus says in verse 31, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. You know, Jesus wasn't concerned about fitting in with the religious elite. He wasn't concerned about spending all of his time, spending, spending his every waking moment with the Pharisees and the scribes. Who did he really care about? You know, he does the right thing. He, he's there with the tax collectors. He's eating with them. He's associating with them. He's using his opportunities. Do you think he really cares what it looks like? We studied uh, in John chapter 4 recently about the Samaritan woman at the well. There's two big problems about the Samaritan woman at the well that the disciples had some real issues with. The first was that Jesus is there by himself talking to this woman. Jesus, you're, you're, you're talking to this woman, right? You, just you and her. Nobody else around. You and this woman. You, you, be careful about what that looks like, Jesus. What did Jesus care about? Did he care about what it looked like? He cared about saving her soul and teaching her about him and, and about God. So, does Jesus care about what it looks like when he is a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman who is Jews and Samaritans have no relationship with each other? Does he care about that? He doesn't care about what it looks like. He doesn't care about the societal norms. He doesn't care about what is okay socially and acceptably at that moment. He only cares about being the physician and looking for people who are sick. He doesn't want to spend his time with these religious elite people. And so he was focused on the goal of saving others. Now, did Jesus embrace awkward situations with others? Yeah, he did. All the time. Constantly. This is only one or two examples, but he did it all the time. Embracing and taking opportunities to awkwardly sit with sinners and adulteresses and people who, the, who society had rejected. Jesus was there to pick them up and to teach them because who were they? They were the most fertile ground, not these religious elite 
people who were around. So what about Peter? We all know the story in Galatians chapter 2. Turn over there with me, Galatians 2, verse 11. Paul recounts a, a circumstance that he has with Peter. We ask the question, was Peter willing to embrace awkward interactions with others? And unfortunately, he was not. Again. Verse 11, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. And when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. I want you to highlight in your mind, I'm going to do an Alanism. Highlight in your mind, fearing it, them, okay? He feared them who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played a hypocrite with them, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Again, highlight that in your mind, hypocrisy. So Peter was filled with fear. Peter was playing the hypocrite, and what does he do? He used to eat with the Gentiles when it was just him and the Gentiles, and then when some of the Jews came from James, then he just said, well, you know, Gentiles, I've got another invitation today, and you guys are going to have to go over there, and I'm going to go over here with my Jewish friends, and we're going to hang out together. What does Paul say about that? You are a hypocrite, Peter. And he withstands him to his face. Not only, this is sort of a meta point, but not only does he withstand him to his face, but he also writes about it here. So you and I are actually the beneficiaries of him standing up to his face. We see the interaction that they had together. Peter was fearful of what others would think. Again, he loved the praise of men more than he loved the praise of God. He wanted to be at peace with the Jews. He wanted to be comfortable with the Jews. You know what he knew better, though? I find this amazing about Peter. Of all the people who should have known better, it was Peter, right? It was Peter who saw the vision of the sheet coming down with the clean and the unclean animals, and what was he told to do? Arise, kill and eat. He knew that the Gentiles were just as accepted into the faith as the Jews were, didn't he? He should have known that. Acts chapter 10, who does he go to, to preach to? Cornelius. He should have known better. Of all the people who should have known better, it was Peter. But he played the hypocrite anyway. This is Peter. And this is why I relate to Peter. Because this kind of thing happens to me. I know better. I know better. But when the moment comes and I am faced with having to make that choice of standing up and saying something difficult or interacting with somebody in a difficult way, it's easy to shrink back. It's easy to shy away. But he wastes an opportunity to help bring the Jews and the Gentiles together. Of all the people who could have brought the Jews and the Gentiles together at this moment, it was Peter. And what does he do? He wastes his opportunity. So what about you? Do you embrace awkward interactions with others? Do you embrace awkward interactions with others? Do you reach out to the lost? Again, this is the whole topic of our personal evangelism class, do you reach out to the lost? Are you hospitable to strangers? Now, I'll say something, you know, fairly candidly. I know we have some visitors here with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, I really appreciate your presence tonight. Are you, are you welcoming to strangers who come into our midst? I mean, you go out of your way to really meet them, talk to them, get to know them, even go so far as to actually go out and spend time with them, have a meal with them, go take care of them, maybe drive them somewhere, help them in whatever ways that you can. And you know sometimes people who visit our number don't know our traditions and don't know our customs and don't necessarily fit in. And if somebody comes in off the street wearing a pair of shorts and smelling like cigarette smoke and is sitting in our number, I really don't care. I care that they're here. And I care that there's an opportunity there that I can take to help teach them and to help be an example and to help them in whatever ways that I can. Do you think Jesus really cared that he was sitting at the table with a bunch of people who are probably talking about things that shouldn't be talked about? I think, so, I think too many times we get wrapped up in how things look, how things are perceived. But let's be really careful. And let's not waste an opportunity. We need to be at peace with all men. And sometimes that means sitting down and having an awkward conversation with a brother and saying, what did you really mean when you said that? What did you really mean when, when, 
when, when you interacted with me that way? Are, are you upset? Do we, is there something wrong between us? Because sometimes it's easy to just assume things about each other, assume things about people's motives and intentions. The awkward conversation is to embrace that difficulty or challenge and go up to your brother and say, let's work this out, rather than me being upset about it overnight, rather than me going home and stewing about it. The awkward thing is to work it out. The awkward thing is to look for opportunities to start conversations with your worldly friends. The awkward thing is to lead your erring brother back to the truth, isn't it? That's the awkward conversation. When you see somebody post something to Facebook that they shouldn't be posting, the awkward thing is to reach out to them and say, I'm not sure you really understand what you're doing. Let's talk about this. Let's work this out. Let's, let me help you understand what you're really doing here. Is there a problem here? The awkward thing is being honest with people and talking to people and trying to lead a brother back to the path. The easy thing is to keep our mouths shut and just let them, hopefully somebody will take care of it. Hopefully somebody will talk to them about their sin. It needs to be us. It needs to be you. And we also, in conclusion here, my last point, you know, one of the greatest benefits that we have is a, is a congregation full of younger kids. We do have a lot of younger kids, a lot of little ones. And you know what, when these little ones grow up and they begin serving or they begin doing things in our services or they begin functioning as part of this body, they are not going to know how to do everything. And also I would say people who might come in from having never stepped foot in a church before might join our number. These people are probably not gonna have any idea about our customs or what we do or the traditions that we have. And you know what, okay. I'm glad they're here. I'm glad they're able to serve. I'm glad they're able to be here with us. And you, as the older, can help train the younger. Are you, as the older, helping to train the younger? Because that's awkward, right? It's awkward training the younger. It's awkward training the younger in age. It's awkward training the younger in the faith. But we need to be doing it. And so ask yourself the question, do you embrace awkward interactions with others? So the two overall questions that we've asked, are you living an awkward life, taking a stand for God when no one else will, and are you willing to embrace awkward interactions with other people? Ask yourself the question. Ask yourself that question all, day, all week this week. And see if you really know the answer. Are you going to be like Jesus, who really was here focused on his mission? Or are you going to be like Peter, who was somebody who gave in and, and squandered many opportunities in his life? Have courage, be bold, and accept the discomfort that's going to come by being, as we talked about in John chapter 15, a servant of the master. If they hated Jesus, they're going to hate you too. Because you're going to be different from the world, and the world doesn't like people who are different from them. Take out your songbooks and turn to the number that's been announced. This is a time in our service where we offer the invitation to anyone who wants to, to come forward and either make their life right with the Lord in baptism by committing yourself to him or asking for the prayers of this group for help in some way. If you are going to commit your life to the Lord tonight, I encourage you to think about counting the cost. I do. Because it's not something that you're going to begin a life where you're going to fit in with the world. Understand that. Be ready to be different from the world from the very get-go. Be willing and ready to stand with Jesus and have the world hate you. Be ready for that. And you know, a little bit of discomfort now is going to work out for an eternity of comfort and joy in heaven. Now, I'm willing to pay that price, are you? Whatever your needs are, please come as we stand and sing.